What was the consequence of alcohol prohibition? Anybody know? Consumption of alcohol went down significantly early and then slowly ticked up. And by the time uh, prohibition ended in 1933, about, it was back to about 70% of what it was during prohibition. So people didn't stop drinking. People didn't stop drinking at all during prohibition. Indeed, what did prohibition actually result in? It resulted in massive increases in crime. It resulted in organized crime, in the mafia, in dramatic increases in what we call cartels today, but in mafia activity back then, in Al Capone, in the rest of all the, all the New York and Chicago. All of that was built around prohibition. What does prohibition do? Prohibition raises the price. Demand's still there. Raises the price for the good. And if the price goes up, if the price goes up, what happens? Well, the price goes up and the risk goes up. The risk of selling, the risk of producing, the risk of transporting. Now, the risk is very high. Who's willing to engage in such risk? Well, people who are willing to engage in violating the law, criminals. The price goes up because the risk is increased. What happens to quality? It goes down. Quality goes down. Price goes up, demand goes down. So yes, use of alcohol went down to about 70% of previous. But also, the appeal of it goes up. Ooh, it's illegal. Isn't that cool? We can go to speakeasy tonight. And people who probably wouldn't have thought of really drinking before prohibition probably drank in prohibition because it was cool. It was just like a lot of kids do drugs, not because drugs are important, but because it's a way of standing up to their parents, to authority, to the man. So as risk goes up, as criminals get involved, as competition gets eliminated, by force, by the way, because that's the only way to deal with competition, when there's no law, when you're outside of the law, this is to the anarchists in the group, when you're outside of the law, the only way to get rid of your competition is violently. I mean, the existence of cartels and mafias and organized crime is an indictment against anarchy, because they live, in a sense, in a world of anarchy. They live, in a sense, in a world with no law. And as a consequence, what you get is immense violence between the cartels. So again, the people engaged in activity have to be violent because they have to defend their turf against other violent people. And then plenty of people get caught in the crossfire. So what prohibition does is it increases the cost, decreases the quality, because there's no competition. So you go, to, you go to Speakeasy and you order some whiskey, and it's not really whiskey, it's some cheap imitation. And what are you going to do? You can't complain. There are no other Speakeasies. It's not like there are other products, there are other available. You can't choose between 55 different forms of whiskey. There's just a one. And it happens to be crap. Prohibition, of course, lasts until December 1933, uh, when the 21st Amendment was ratified and prohibition goes away. The mafia stays, organized crime stays, why? Well, because there's still victimless crimes, whether it's prostitution, whether it's gambling, that's what the mafia focuses on. And of course, then ever more increasingly, they focus on drugs as drugs become more and more illegal. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act is passed. Federal law placed tax on sale of cannabis, hemp, or marijuana. Now, states, state law prohibited some drugs over this period. But the war on drugs really did not get introduced until 1970, when President Nixon signed the Controlled Substance Act which called for the regulation of certain drugs and substances. 
It basically took drugs and classified them into five different categories. Schedule one drugs, which are considered the most dangerous and illegal, um, and they, they, you know, they, high, they pose a high degree uh, risk of addiction, little evidence of medical benefits, they claim. And those include marijuana, LSD, heroin, MDMA, which is ecstasy, and cocaine. And then they have class two drugs, class three drugs, class four, class five, right? And class five would include something like cough medication, which has a small amount of codeine, no big deal, right? Now this is federalized. In June of 1971, Nixon officially declares a war on drugs, stating drug abuse as public enemy number one. Not just drug trade, not just drug importation, not just drug uh, uh, manufacturing, but the consumption of drugs is now illegal and there's a war on it. Now remember what a war is. War usually engages the military in actions overseas against an invader or somebody threatening the United States. Now, the war is engaged with domestic people, people using drugs, people producing drugs in the United States. There's a war against Americans. In 1973, Nixon creates the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA. The DEA starts out with 1,470 special agents on a budget of less than 75 million. As of recently, I'm not sure exactly what year this is, the agency had 5,000 agents and a budget of $2.03 billion. Went from 75 million to 2 billion. And that is a fraction of what is actually spent on the war on drugs. Because one of the things that the war on good drugs involves is not just the DEA. It involves dozens of federal agencies dozens of federal agencies. Both agencies focused on law enforcement domestically, like uh, tobacco and firearms, but also agencies that are involved in military activities or espionage activities outside the US. For example, the CIA is actively engaged in the war on drugs. The NSA, national, you know, the guys who listen, the guys who track your emails, the guys who do all the electronic stuff, we have back doors into all our electronic devices who are listening right now to this conversation. Well, it's public, so no big deal that they're listening. But I have a feeling they often listen to my private conversations. The NSA is involved in the drug war. They view it as a national security threat, and they listen in, in support of the DEA and other federal agencies with regard to drug war. And I know this firsthand. I was at the NSA. I spent a whole day at the NSA. They told me this, and I argued with them that drugs were not a national security threat. They would have nothing of it. And they insisted it was, and it was part of their mandate to listen in on conversations related to drugs. Now, that's a lot of conversations. That's a lot of activity in and out of the United States. So the drug war is expansive, extensive, and unbelievably destructive. Right? You know, one-fifth of all the incarcerated population is serving time for a drug charge. One-fifth, 456,000 people. Another 1.15 million people in the United States on probation and parole for drug-related offenses. Now notice that that's 1.15 plus 456, let's say 1.5 million Americans. 1.5 million Americans, and that's just right now, but there are many more Americans, have a criminal record related to drug, a drug offense that is a victimless crime. This is possession or sale or something, we're not talking about violence. That means that they can probably not get any student loans. Many colleges will not accept them. Many jobs they can't have. This literally involves the destruction of the lives of 1.5 million people. Many of them, by the way, minorities, because the war on drugs clearly affects minorities in dramatic ways, 
more than it does anyone else. 1.5 million are never going to be able to go to school, get a job. Um, number of Americans arrested for possession has tripled since 1980. Reached, it reached 1.3 million arrests in 2015. 1.3 million arrests in 2015 alone. Right? And that's just for possession. It's not for trade, for sale, which is another large number, smaller than that, but large number. So you have here a, a whole police activity engaged in stopping people from using drugs that hurt themselves. Themselves. Again, you're much more likely to commit a crime while intoxicated than you are to commit a crime on drugs. Now, let's go through some of the damage the war on drugs does. Um, what prohibition does is it raises the chances that drugs will be tainted. It increases the possibility of overdose. And it increases the possibility of getting a disease from the drugs. It's hard to buy syringes because, you know, you need now a prescription, you need a reason. So, because syringes are associated with drugs and uh, we, we don't allow the sale of syringes. So people use syringes, they use used syringes, they get hepatitis B, hepatitis C, they get AIDS from syringes. Drugs are tainted. The quality of the drugs is reduced because, again, there's no market, there's no competition, there's no... Um, way to, 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 to say, oh, no, this provider of drugs is, is, is terrible. You should use drugs from this guy. I mean, this is about monopolization by force of certain areas. You can't, you can't pick and choose. You know, you can't now with marijuana when it's legal. But when it's illegal, you're stuck with the one provider. So, uh, drug prohibition creates more deaths, more disease, more overdoses, and actually more use of stronger drugs. And, and this, again, economics would tell you, once you outlaw all drugs, then people want the biggest, buck, uh, uh, biggest bang for the buck, which means the strongest drug, the stronger form of marijuana, the strongest form of heroin, the strongest form of cocaine. Because if I'm going to pay for it, I might as well really get what I'm paying for. And again, there's no quality control. There's no rating agencies. There's no consumer reports. There's, there's nothing. So you get more sick people. You get more diseased people. You get more dead people. There's also less investment in treatment. I, I, you know, I, first time I heard this point was from Gary Becker. The, uh, the great Chicago economist. And he said, look, imagine if you legalize drugs tomorrow. There'd be a whole industry of helping people get off of drugs. There'd be a whole industry of helping people get off of heroin, get off of cocaine, uh, stop their addiction. And it would be above board. It wouldn't have to be secret. And of course, all of that doesn't exist. There'd be better ways of delivering the drugs. You wouldn't necessarily have to use needles. There might be more efficient ways to get the same effect without taking on the risks of using needles. Thank you, Vonda. I really appreciate the support. So there are many, many benefits to legalization that actually dramatically, not a little bit, dramatically reduce the risk of using drugs. Now, some of you would say, well, if you reduce the risk of using drugs, more people will use them. Maybe, but the empirical evidence suggests that's not true. Portugal, which, which decriminalized drugs, <clears throat> I think, in 2000, has not seen a dramatic increase in usage. Actually, has seen a decrease, particularly among young people. It's just taken out the romance out of it. 
taking out the problem. You know, they see drug users for what they really are, losers. The only people who can actually get quality drugs and pay prices for high quality drugs are the wealthy who, who in uh, Silicon Valley microdose LSD and in uh, Wall Street snort cocaine. And they get high quality stuff. But most people, the people who are addicted to this stuff, get the junk. And therefore much more likely to die. And you can see that in the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis to a large extent is because all of this is underground. There's no quality control. There's no market. People get addicted. It's very hard to get out of the addiction. There's no investment in services to get people out of addiction. We rely on the state to do it all because the state is the one that's prohibited it. This should all be privatized. So the war on drugs kills people who use the drugs. But beyond that, prohibition creates violence. I mean, the degree of violence is Im it's hard to measure. Not just in the United States, but in Colombia, in Mexico, in Afghanistan, in all over the world, wherever drugs are produced, manufactured, traded, moved from place to place, the amount of violence that follows the drugs is just unbelievable. In Mexico, something like 85,000 people have died over the last couple of decades. 85,000 people. Nobody, nobody actually measures the numbers of people who die in the United States because of violence related to drugs. But something like 45% of all the murders in New York City are related to drugs in one way or another. Related to drug cartels, turf wars, gang wars, innocent bystanders. So, drug prohibition creates cartels, organized crime. The organized crime has an incentive to become more and more sophisticated in terms of its violence. It intimidates, and people die. And the number of people who die from the violence created by the war on drugs far exceeds the number of people who die from overdose or the number of people who suffer from that. And if you legalize them, the number of people who died from overdose would plummet, and the number of people who died from the damage of the, of, of, from the violence would plummet. And then finally, and I think this is really crucial, drugs encourage corruption. Drug cartels have a lot of money. Because it's illegal, it's incredibly profitable. They use that money to bribe police officers, military personnel at the borders, judges, all kinds of officials. Police who make very little money get offered suitcases full of cash to turn away from a victimless crime. Why not do it? Why not go into policing in order to take advantage of the of the huge amounts of money. Every movie you watch, every movie you watch where police are corrupt, they're corrupted by the drug trade. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that's a reflection of reality. It's unbelievable the quantities of money they deal with cash, easy to corrupt officials. And in Mexico, it's not like if you don't accept a bribe, the cartel just walks away. If you don't accept a bribe, the cartel will kill your kids. So the cartels are so powerful that they force people, in a sense, to take the bribe. And you can see this over and over again. You know, somebody mentions the movie Supico, but Supico was done years and years ago, decades ago. And the war on drugs, has it won, have we won it? Is there less drugs in America today? Because of the trillion dollars, by the way, we've spent at the federal level, one trillion dollars on the war on drugs. And what have we achieved? The death and destruction of many, many lives. Millions, arguably, given how many people have landed up in jail because of this. I cannot think of a policy that relates to police more horrific and damaging and destructive than the war drugs. Not because I care about the users. I don't care that much about the users. 
But I care about the corrupting influence it has on the police. I care about the corrupting, in, about the, 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 the violence that it spreads in our communities. And one of the things, one of the things that we're seeing right now, one of the things that it does to the police is not just corrupting them. It militarizes them. It forces them, a trillion dollars for what? A trillion dollars on paying salaries of everybody, on buying equipment, on doing missions, on whatever the DEA and all these law enforcement agencies do with regards to the war on drugs. One trillion dollars since 1971 when it was launched. But think about the fact that these cartels have bigger and bigger guns. These gangs have bigger and bigger guns. So the police need bigger and bigger guns. And in the name of the war on drugs, the police now get massive quantities of military equipment from the military. From the military. It's, yeah, I forgot to mention this with regard to corruption. Think of the civil forfeiture laws. A big reason for the civil forfeiture laws was around drugs. Most of the civil forfeitures around, you know, the commission of a drug crime. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The amount of policing that is engaged in drugs that is engaged in the war of drugs is astounding. You could probably have half the police that we have today if you got rid of the war on drugs. But going back to this militarization, because this is a, a big deal right now, uh, not only is the military involved, not only is the NSA and the CIA and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Departments and the uh, uh, DHS and the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI and all these agencies involved in this, right? But we have historically tried to separate the activities of the military from the police. And yet since the war on drugs, we have systematically been selling military equipment from the military to the police. Uh, this started in 1981, where a bill was passed called the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act, which allowed the De Department of Defense to share information with local police departments and to participate in local counter uh, drug operations and to transfer excess military equipment and other materials to domestic law enforcement for the purposes of combating illegal drugs. This is a federal law, which has evolved over the years. There's been a number of iterations of it, but it's basically led to the sale from the Department of Defense to police of aircraft, armor, riot gear, surveillance equipment, and weapons. None of which is needed for regular law enforcement. All of which is needed if you're going up against well-equipped, dangerous gangs. All funded by, the drug, by drugs. By the fact that we have a drug law. And the more vicious the drug war becomes, the higher the prices drugs sell for, the more cash these people have. Now, not only that, but some of the police tactics, the number of SWAT teams has exploded. Every little county has a SWAT team. Every little town police force has a SWAT team, fully equipped and trained often by the military. For what? Primarily to engage in the drug war. Now think about no-knock raids. We've heard about no-knock raids. We just had a case of a no-knock raid. They, they, they went into the wrong place. Wrong apartment, these people, you know, went for a gun because they didn't know who was breaking into their place, and the police shot them. Completely innocent people. And this happens a lot. Happens a lot. But why do no knock, trade, no knock raids happen? Because of the war on drugs. Almost all no knock raids, where they just force themselves into your house, imagine that. The police just forcing themselves into your house. Why would they do that? Well, because they think you're trading, storing, producing drugs. Almost all these no-knock drug raids are involved, are drug-related. Drug eliminate the war on drugs. You eliminate these issues. You eliminate the number of interactions between police and people. The reason police search cars when they stop you for a traffic stop 
is they're looking for drugs, drug paraphernalia, drug production equipment. If you get rid of the drug motivation, you get rid of the motivation to search your car. And often you get rid of the reason for them to stop the car to begin with. Now there's massive, it looks like, racial bias with regard to the war on drugs. And if it goes away, I mean, think of the 1.1 million people who have it on the criminal record. There are many more of that, but currently, right now, either on parole or in prison, 1.5 million. But think of all the past people. I just can't think of any one law that is more damaging, more, um, it, it, you know, causes more violence, causes more potential for bad action by the cops, uh, causes more distortion of policing, causes more police corruption than the war on drugs. If you really care about police reform, real police reform, then the first thing you should want to do is eliminate the war on drugs. That should be the first plaque on anything. Now, there are other things like war on immigrants and other, but war on drugs is the biggest one of all of them. There's no question that it is by far the worst. And by far the reason why police are as aggressive as they are. Because the bad guys have become so aggressive. And the bad guys are so aggressive because there's a huge monetary cost here. Now, the best treatment of this I have seen is in a fantastic TV series, one of my favorites all time, um, called... The name, believe it or not, is just slipped from my mind. Baltimore, uh, multiple seasons. Somebody is going to tell me on, uh, and I've talked about it before, so somebody's going to tell me on the, on the chat the name of the show. But um, the show itself, The Wire, of course, The Wire. The sh for some reason, I kept thinking The Wall, The Wall. No, it's The Wire. And uh, The Wire, I think in season three, but the whole wire is all about the drug trade. It's all about the drug trade versus the cops. It, one of the characters, one of the bad guys in the, on the drug side actually gets an MBA in order to run the drug business better and turn it more into a business. And of course, that never works. So, so you know, the, the number of victims, the number of, of people who die in the show for no reason, because of, again, a victimless crime, because of, a, because of the violence instigated by this prohibition is just astounding and it's shocking and it's depressing and it's sad but in one in season three I think it is the police are so pissed off because the fact is they're fighting this war on drugs year after year after year after year they arrest people they put people in jail they catch huge stores of cocaine and heroin and whatever and it makes zero difference zero difference it just keeps going on and on and on and on so in season three, they legalize drugs. They basically say to the drug cartels, to the gangs, here's a few, here are a few uh, blocks of uh, Baltimore that are deserted, deserted homes. Nobody lives there. Nobody, nobody functions there. You can have that. Basically create a market there. We will protect your ability to sell drugs there with no harm will protect you from each other and we won't enforce the law in this few blocks of deserted property. And the effect is astounding, truly astounding. What happens is that the neighborhoods where the drug dealers were selling drugs on every corner of every street suddenly blossom. People go out of their homes. Kids go out to play. People plant flowers. These neighborhoods are reborn in the poorest parts of Baltimore because the drug trade has moved away. It's moved to this safe zone. And within the safe zone, nonprofits come in providing clean needles to the users, providing medical services, providing mental health services to try to help the users get over the drugs or at least stay safe while they use it. And crime in the city, and this is the thing that 
really astounds everybody. Crime in the city plummets. And of course, the mayor doesn't know about all this. The police are doing this quietly behind the mayor's back. And suddenly, the mayor sees crime is going way down. Way down. The number of killings, the number of murders, the number of burglaries, the number of every aspect of crime, violent crime, goes down. And the mayor is astounded by this. And at some point, he discovers it, and he stays quiet about it. But then, then the Bush administration finds out about it, and they shut it down. And you see at the end of the season how everything goes back to the way it was. The street dealers go back into the neighborhoods, the flowers get destroyed, the kids go back into the homes they can't play outside, the violence escalates, murders go up, every aspect of crime goes up. So it's a beautiful concretization of what would happen if drugs were legalized. You can also go to Portugal and see it in Portugal, criminalized, decriminalized drugs in 2000. So it's been 20 years now, and it's been an amazing, amazingly success story. So I recommend The Wire. It's on HBO. You can get it on HBO, and I would watch it. I think it's five seasons, all excellent. But that season where they legalize drugs is exceptional, truly exceptional. Um, Okay, so drug legalization, if you really care, if you care about police brutality, if you care about police corruption, if you care about the police, if you care about the victims of the police, no matter who you care about, war on drugs is wrong. Now, ultimately, the war on drugs is wrong, not because of any of the things I said, although all of them are true. The war on drugs is wrong because it is a violation of individual rights. The role of government is to protect rights. The role of government is to protect us from those that would harm us, those would, who defraud us, those who would steal us or take our lives. It's not to regulate what we consume, what we take into our bodies. It's not to stop us from committing suicide. It's not to stop us from doing immoral things. It's not to make us good people or good citizens. It's to protect us. And the war drugs does none of that. It does the opposite. It actually violates the rights of people to do wrong things, to do bad things to themselves. But if we're going to protect the right of good people to use their mind, to use their reason, to live for themselves, to pursue their happiness, there's no way to protect that right without protecting the right of people to destroy their lives. So again, I don't advocate for legalizing drugs for the sake of the junkies. I advocate for the legalization of drugs for the sake of those of us who don't use drugs and want to live in safety, for the sake of police who don't we don't want to go up against these violent gangs, and I don't want them to be tempted by corruption. And for the sake of the principle, the principle that it's not the business of government to be involved in such things, because once they try to tell us what we can consume with regard to drugs, it's also going to be with regard to food, what we drink, what we eat, and everything else. And we see that, of course. We see that, of course. So one of the most immoral, made one of the most destructive laws on the books is the law of drugs. Not only should it be decriminalized, drugs should be legalized, legalized. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So 
I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...